Hello. <coughs> Hello, I'm Dr. Anil Gudi. I'm a consultant in reproductive medicine, surgery, and assisted conception at the Homerton Fertility Center. So today, we look at a slightly different subject which may throw insight into biochemical pregnancies and aneuploidy. So, we all know that PGTA, or rather in all terms, P genetic screening of embryos, has, is, has come in across the world and many centers led literally from the United States are now slowly moving slowly into pre-genetic screening of embryos. Now the question now comes up is what is the role of PGTA for recurrent implantation failures or recurrent miscarriage and that's different from doing a general screening of embryos. So let's go back to the history and there are multiple technologies have been employed. And you look at go into array compared with genomic hybridization, that is array CGH, and you would go into DPCR, then go into single nucleotide polymerase uh, polymorphism, that is SNP, the real type quantitative PCR, that, and now it is next generation sequencing. And fi finally, to clear all the terminologies, it was re renamed as PGTA, pre-implantation genetics testing for aneuploidy. So in this paper, which was published in 2019, throws light on this subject. So when you look at recurrent pregnancy loss, and there are multiple causes, antiphospholipid syndrome, uterine anomalies, parental chromosomal abnormalities, embryonic chromosomal abnormalities, and in fact, when the products of conception were analyzed, and if you remember, I'd done a talk on how many of the uh, you know, embryonic or miscarriages are genetically uh, driven, and about 40 to 50% are caused by abnormal cardiotype. So what happens to the rest 50%? So people have tried in the past to do pre-genetic screening of embryos, and they've looked at and the success rates haven't been very different. And they also looked at miscarriage rates and the miscarriage rates have been very much the same. Recurrent implantation failure is a far more complex subject. And if somebody says we know the causes, sadly, the answer is no. It is awfully difficult to be, to be able to explain the causes. Complex pathologies, often unknown. Aneuploidy is one of the factors, so abnormal, Embryos are one of the factors which causes repair implantation failure. And as you get older, and it varies between 58 to 70 or 80 percent of embryos over the age of 40 will be genetically abnormal. So, what was the study? The study was to compare live birth rate with or without PGTA in patients with recurrent pregnancy loss caused by embryonic aneuploidy and patients with repeated implantation failure were also analyzed. So it was, so if you look at the materials and methods, multicentric prospective study over almost 18 months, 10 patients in each, uh, uh, in each group age-wise 35 to 36, 37 to 38, 39 to 40, and then 41 to 42. PGTA and a non-PGTA control group. So the cases of, rec of recurrent miscarriage need to have at least one miscarriage due to aneuploidy. And all these patients underwent a systematic evaluation, 4D scans, histosalpingogram, sonohistosalpingogram, antiphospholipid syndrome testing, lupus anticoagulant, and anticardiolipin antibody. Recurrent implant, implantation failure needed to have at least three or more implantation failures after IVF and ET. So let's look at the results for repeated pregnancy loss. So if you, if you look at the two factors, or if you look at how many patients had embryo transfer. So in a PGTA group, only half the patients had embryo transfer. In a non-PGTA group, 97% of patients had a transfer. So that, so what does it tell you? It tells you that if you're going to do pre-PGTA, 
then there'll be a proportion of patients who will not have an embryo transfer. And that is a reality. So if you have a look at the clinical pregnancy rate per transfer, and that's stunningly high in the PGTA group and a non-PGTA group, it's much lower. But more importantly, let's look at the biochemical pregnancy. The biochemical pregnancy in the PGTA group is 12.5% and a non-PGTA group is 45%. And look at the live birth rate per embryo transfer. There is no doubt that PGTA increases live birth rates significantly, even in patients with re repeat re recurrent pregnancy loss, but only per transfer. So if you look at it per patient, so if you say 100 patients going through PGTA and 100 patients not going to go in, going through PGTA, so what happens with results? The results are similar. So if you take the, the success rate, just similar per patient because there'll be a significant number of patients who will have all abnormal embryos and will, who will never have a transfer. So that's how the, the, you can draw a conclusion. So the conclusion was per patient, there didn't seem to be any difference but the live birth rates per ET were significantly higher in the PGTA group and PGTA reduced biochemical pregnancy rates significantly. So let's look at recurrent implant, implantation loss. And again, the story is the same. Only half the number of patients went for a transfer and in fact, you did not get to a blastocyst stage in about 18% of the non-PGTA group too. Biochemical loss again, low in the PGTA, PGTA group and very high in the non-biopsy group. Clinical pregnancy rate significantly higher in the PGTA group per embryo transferred and lower in the non-PGTA group. So if you look at per patient, it was about 35%, 26% because again, about 30 you know, 43% of patients did not have a transfer. So that's something you have to, it's important to realize. So per embryo transfer, PGTA improved live birth rates. It has the advantage of reducing number of embryo transfers. So if it's abnormal, you're not going to put it back. So and that's a discussion you need to have with patients. So often patients would ask you, what is the advantage? And I'll say, to some, to some extent, not always, to some extent, we will not be putting back genetically abnormal, grossly genetically abnormal embryos. Now, it is, there's also speculation. What causes biochemical pregnancies? Because it's very difficult. And if you have a look at the study, there's a speculation that comes from this study and like many others, that it may be genetic abnormalities that may give rise to biochemical pregnancies. But that's, that question is going to be phenomenally difficult to answer. Now what we know is as a pregnancy progresses, genetic abnormalities start decreasing. So what do we say? We say, you know, if you have a stillbirth, then, uh, which is very unfortunate, it is, then it, it is less, th there's a very small chance that that baby would be genetically abnormal. It accounts for only 4% of stillbirths. While in clinical pregnancies, aneuploidy accounts for 70 to 80% of clinical pregnancies. In the newborn, only 0.3% of newborns will have genetic abnormalities. Thus, use that logic and biochemical pregnancies, maybe, again, I am saying speculating, maybe due to genetic abnormalities. Also, if you have a look at it, then the distribution of double trisomy is higher in recurrent miscarriage, and the euploidy rate is higher in recurrent miscarriages, and that's important. It's different from having a recurrent implantation failure. And also what tends to happen is in, annual, in recurrent miscarriages, abnormal embryos seem to implant because probably the receptivity window, window is much better. So if you look at the age factor, you'll see that aneuploid, euploidy rather keeps on decreasing as age decreases. And by 41 and 42, we are looking at about a 10 to 15% euploidy rate of embryos being genetically normal. So the question now comes up is how many cycles or how many oocyte retrievals are needed to get one euploid embryo? And in recurrent uh, miscarriages, it is less. So you're more likely to get a, a euploid embryo faster in a, somebody with a recurrent pregnancy loss because the causative factors 
may be non-genetic. And it takes about, if you have a look at it, at 35 it takes less than a cycle, by 42 it takes about five cycle oocyte retrievals to get one euploid embryo, while in recurrent implantation failures, it continues to increase. By 40, it takes about five oocyte retrievals to get one. And by 41, 42, nine oocyte retrievals to get, probably get to one uh, euploid embryo. And again, these are all statistics. And I, here the answers are still much murky and we haven't yet come down to the clear answers. So in short, you know, you need more robust trials and these trials may give us more answers. So what does this study tell us? A study in, for those who use pre-genetic screening of embryos, it does tell us a very simple thing. It tells us that a large no, a significant number of patients may not get a transfer because th these embryos may be grossly abnormal. They may have milder mosaic patterns, which is a big question altogether. And that's where the challenge against PGTA is coming. But that's not a discussion you have with patients. But also you have to tell patients that PGTA does not guarantee your baby. PGTA em embryos will miscarry and there's a proportion of them. Plus, they may have a biochemical loss. And that disc is going to be with us for many, many years to come because we still don't know the right answer. Anyway, that is in short about this beautiful study. And I hope you enjoyed it. Please like the page and please share it. You know, let us try and get evidence-based science to as many people as possible. Thank you very much.